Good afternoon, Mold Chapel. Anyway, we're going to begin service, so those of you outside, please come in. Those on the inside, please stand.
It is my sanctuary and uh, it is the place where I just come and I can let everything go and just feel free you know and it's just a reminder you know when, when, when I come to church that this is not just a church moment but it can be an everyday moment but it does take work I wish I take I could take all you guys home every day all day long you know worshiping and reminding me how to stay focused you know, uh, one of the things that I'm really blessed with, uh, you know, I, 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 when I'm in worship, I'm not only trying to hear God, but I, I, I try to get this sense of what God uh, is, the atmosphere that God is trying to set. And, you know, I, I've been listening to the songs and, you know, I, I, I want to share something that I think is so important. And uh, it coincides with the book, I, I believe. I, I, I get amnesia after the week, Paul, I forget everything. Uh, but, you know, when Andrew was praying, when we was worshiping, uh, there is something, in fact, was that song? There's something that's, that, something beautiful about to happen when God's people is in one accord. And that happens in the church setting like this all the time because we're here for one purpose. To the glory of God. Just imagine we take this and we take it home with us and we have the same mindset. This is how we get through the day. Right? Life is rough. And sometimes we can have some rough situations in our lives. But having this heart 
of worship and thanksgiving for the Lord really sets us in a place that allows the fullness of God's blessing to fall, uh, fall upon us. Does that make sense? So I, I pray, you know, we still got a message to go through. But if anything we leave out, leave with today, I pray that we understand the importance that our coming together has when it comes to edifying and building each other up. It is huge. All right, so the title of the message, the tease that steals Christ, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Uh, we are in Numbers chapter 12. This is part two. Uh, last week, we looked at chapter uh, part one, which was to do with comparison. And this week, we're going to look at something different. I want to share a story that I found uh, Dwight Moody had shared to help set the stage for what we're about to learn. He goes like this. There once was an eagle that was envious of another eagle that could fly higher, better than it could. One day, the bird saw a hunter with a bow and arrow and said to him, I wish you would shoot down that eagle up there. The hunter said he would if he had some feathers for his arrow. So the jealous eagle pulled one out of his wing. The arrow was shot but it didn't quite reach the rival bird because he was flying too high. The first eagle pulled out another feather and another feather until he had lost so many feathers he himself couldn't fly anymore. The hunter took advantage of this situation. He turned around and killed the now helpless eagle. The moral of the story. If you are envious of others, the one you will hurt the most by your actions will be yourself. We're talking this week uh, on a series of how these different mindsets can steal our joy, steal our thanks, thankfulness. And so, Envy is the second thief along with his cousin. He guys probably tripping out. He has a cousin. Yeah, Envy's cousin's name is Jealousy. These two members, family members, isn't just characteristics of people that, is, that don't know Jesus. It's not the characteristics of people who are new in faith. In fact, if we we're going to be really honest, envy sneaks in its, its way uh, into each of our hearts, even if we have followed Jesus for years. In fact, that is, that'll be our study today. Today we're going to find a high priest, a prophetess, behave in this manner. And there are people, these guys are people that are not young believers. They've been serving the Lord for a while. Let's read the story. It comes from Numbers 12 verses 1 to 15. And it says this. While they were at Hagra, Miram and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? But the Lord heard them. Now Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. So immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam and said, go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. So the three of them went to the tabernacle. Then the Lord descended in the pillar of cloud uh, and, and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam, he called out, and they set forth. And the Lord said to them, Now listen to what I say. If there, was a pro uh, if there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions. I would speak to them in dreams, but not with my servant Moses. Of all my house, he is the one I trust. I speak to him face to face. 
cer uh, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? The Lord was very angry with them and departed. As the cloud moved from above the tabernacle, there, there stood Miriam, her skin as white as snow from leprosy. When Aaron saw what had happened to her, he cried out to Moses, Oh my master, please don't punish us for this sin we have so foolishly committed. Don't let her be like a stillborn baby already decayed at birth. So Moses cried out to the Lord, Oh God, I beg you, please heal her. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had done nothing more than spit in her face, wouldn't she be defiled for seven days? So keep her outside the camp for seven days, and after that she may be accepted back. So Miriam was kept outside the camp for seven days, and the people waited until she was brought back before they traveled again. Then they left Hazra and camped, on, uh, camped in the wilderness of Paran. Crazy, crazy story, right? Now, I want you guys to keep in mind that this story takes place several years after Israel had left Egypt. It'll be in the time of what we call, the Bible called the Exodus, okay? Uh, and Miriam and Aaron, uh, they are spiritual leaders, okay? So they had the right, I want you guys to understand this, the spiritual, the spiritual leaders uh, uh, in, 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 in that time, in, the, in that level of you know, where they were, uh, they had the right and even the responsibility to correct or rebuke Moses if Moses did something wrong. But the problem here was there was nothing done wrong. You see, they accused him of marrying outside the tribe of Israel. And although the Bible doesn't record it, we can conclude that his first wife, uh, the prior, probably had passed away. Now, you know, when I was doing a study, I was thinking, oh, people gonna say, oh, so why did he marry outside of his, uh, the Hebrew race? Because that was a law. Well, when you die and go to heaven, you know, you can ask God because the Bible doesn't state it. So we cannot make conclusions about it. We just have to receive it, okay? Uh, and we can all come up with our, you know, opinions. And, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I, I get some really good opinions on why, you know? And, and it would actually justify what he did. But then again, it's just my opinion. So we'll leave that out, okay? Uh, so, we read this story and we, we kind of get, we can get caught up, like I said, on, hey, so what was the deal with the marriage thing? But that's not the big picture here. The big picture that we need to focus on is Miriam and Aaron. And why did they accuse Moses of being proud? Because that's what it is happening. They would start to stir up. He's so proud and so prideful that he can do stuff that we cannot do. It's kind of sound familiar. Yeah, we wouldn't admit it. Right? But we can act just like this. Now, what I love about this is that they're accusing Moses of a sin that they're full of. The very thing they're saying Moses is dealing with pride and being proud, right? Is the same thing that if they would look was all about them. That's why they're doing what they're doing. In fact, I, I want to say that, you know, we read this and, and Aaron has another part of the story that, that, that shows his, uh, his faults. Today is really kind of more about Miriam's fault because she's the instigator, right? She's the one getting all crazy, you know, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit, but you know what she did, right? She's all envious and everything and then jealous and she goes and calls her brother in. And, and, and just keep that in mind, that, you know, she's, she's starting it. And, you know, 
brother Aaron just hanging on to big sister and saying okay so why does it matter so so basically Miriam doesn't like what she sees right uh, and she comes up with this accusation but I you know kind of thinking about this thing is like why does it matter who he married well you know what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some reasons uh, because behind every jealousy and every envy there's a reason okay well kind of put that uh, later on connect it but let's look at what, what caused their actions as I mentioned earlier you know we got to kind of know the story a little bit Moses uh, she Miriam is Moses' big sister and, and she played a big role in Moses' survival okay remember I believe it was back in Exodus 1 when uh, Pharaoh had commanded that all the Hebrew young boys or babies would be killed well Miriam was the young sister that took uh, Moses to, to the Nile and, and even guided that baby in this basket that was floating in the water to run into Pharaoh's daughter and not only did she make that happen right now when Moses needed to get winged off because he was still a baby and needed milk and Pharaoh's daughter definitely wasn't pregnant because it wasn't her child so she had no way of ensuring that this baby would be fed and now keep in mind this is so crazy how God works she knew that baby was a Hebrew baby because the commandment that they had sent out was to drown all the babies in the Nile you know and so she knew what was happening this is Pharaoh's daughter right and, and so Mario pops up you know I, I don't know how she popped up but she probably was watching you know kind of, we, we're good at doing this but watching and uh, finally when the basket came in and she saw this and it was like oh, who's gonna nurse the baby and here comes Miriam I know somebody who could do it and unbelievably God moves in such a great awesome way that Moses is nursed by his own mother until he is able to be winged and then now turn over fully to the, the, the uh, daughter of Pharaoh so we read you know um, Miriam has some big big part of this big sister was like a mama right probably even bossy I don't know you know I got a big sister she was kind of bossy when I was young <laughs> yeah her name is Candy by the way because like no <laughs> Uh, so not only did she keep this in you know make this happen keep in mind that uh, when Moses' first wife passed away she probably took on a bunch of the, the duties of taking care of her younger brother she did the cooking the cleaning even making sure the, the servants are all intact there is no doubt that she loved her brother I, I don't doubt that right and and she wanted to take care of him and sometimes we can get comfortable in the position that we're at and we can start to get envious or, or jealous about anybody that might be trying to steal that from us all right because now you think about it, she's the lady in charge. You know, the, there's a saying, right? You can only have one queen bee in the hive. Miriam was the queen bee at that time. And now Moses goes out and marries this Kushite woman. And that's a whole other story that's really crazy. I mean, you can do this stuff, it's really good, interesting study. And now not only has she been replaced, but she lost her import, uh, position of importance. Now the wife becomes the second minister, if you would, with the husband as they lead the nation. God is really crazy how he's working, right? And so she's probably not so happy that the lady that's doing all this and messing up her life isn't even a Hebrew. 
I started to think about that and I said, you know, I'm kind of putting myself in that situation. Would I be upset? Planning people, I don't know if you're going to be honest, but for me, I was like, yeah, I'd be mad. I'm like, what the heck? You, I was here all this time. And you will come in and you think you're going to take my stuff, right? You know, just kind of being honest, right? Um, and so I started to think about this and I was thinking, so is it wrong for her to feel that way? No, because she it would be truthful. The wrong came when she put actions to what she was feeling. Because that, what she was feeling, she could have took that to the Lord and said, Lord, help me to understand. Help me to deal with this. But instead, she took that and she allowed that to manifest in her that she didn't seek counsel from the Lord. She started seeking counsel from herself and herself was, get that lady out. So, the point or what we need to see here is having this junk feeling is, is part of, of who we are. We are humans. But we need to correct that feeling. We read this in scripture all the time. The longer we leave this kind of feelings in us, it manifests into something that isn't good. When it manifests into what this beast or monster is, we find ourselves far, far away from God and His blessing. By that time, the damage is so huge that sometimes we don't make it back. So we see this, and, and I love this because this is so real, this is part of life. But the problem with Miriam was she acted upon her emotions. She let her emotions dictate what God was going to do. She goes up and she's all mad with what's going on. So she doesn't only, you know, deal with it with herself and pray about it. No, she goes out and calls her younger brother, Aaron, who's actually the older brother of Moses. And they team up, right? And they go to the people and they start mouthing off. Trying to embarrass or cause Moses to, to change his what he's doing to doubt even what God is telling him and doing uh, and so that action is what God is going to reprimand or we read in the story did do by causing her to get leprosy now I went through the reasons just to kind of put ourselves in that place because it can happen and when it does happen, we need to be careful and we need to deal with it the right way. We cannot let these things manifest in us too long. So, most if not all evil behavior, okay, that exists in all of us, comes from a place deep inside of us that has been broken or hurt. I want you guys to think about it for a moment. A lot of times when we are jealous or envious of somebody, it is because of something in our life when we was a child or, or you know, teens or whatever that broke us or e e even uh, hurt us to the point that now every time something close to that happens, we, we start to get crazy right and we start to point fingers and we want to point it out we want to tell them oh you 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 and it's usually a good sign that there's something going on on the inside and nothing's wrong with that because we live in a world where a lot of bad things happen you know um, I'll be the first to tell you that my life wasn't a really good life I had a rough life being homeless and stuck with drugs and alcohol and all that stuff. And I don't think my life would have been that bad if my childhood would have been a little bit different. But I came from a family that drinking and was part of that. And I'm not saying that it was all horrible, but there was a lot of damages that would happen that carried on into my adulthood. 
So the hurt, if we're not careful and we don't start to deal with it, and a lot of people will say, oh, I've dealt with it, but you know, the honesty of it is that we've just hidden it really good. We've learned to protect ourselves. And by protecting ourselves, we become very unemotional and unsensitive to what God is trying to do in our lives. Miriam is this example to us of, a dang of the dangers of envy and jealousy. She teaches us how dangerous it is to allow that kind of mindset to say that now, you guys gotta remember now, she, she wasn't just Moses' sister. God used her. You know, uh, I believe I mentioned it later on, but you know, just so you guys kind of know that uh, she carried the name prophetess. God would use her. God even used her several times to lead worship. That was a big deal. Alright? But she allowed her heart to focus on the things which started her down this road that led God to rebuke her. You know, a lot of times people say, ah, you know, I don't need to worry. You know, I pray that everyone here never ever takes himself to that place of being rebuked by the Lord. It's not a place we want to be. If you read scripture, you'll find that it is a place of, of, of crazy, heavy discipline. It, it's nuts. But why? Why would we take ourselves there when we know what kind of good there is for us in the presence of the Lord? So we, we, we look at this and then uh, I want to look at, you know, when Miriam allowed jealousy and envy to just kind of harbor in her. What she did was she elevated herself. She thought of herself being greater than she is. And when I say that, I want you guys to understand this. I think each one of you should know this, that you are the apple of God's eye. That you are so important. When he sees you, he's looking at just you. You have to understand just how special you are. I don't care what the world thinks. I don't even care what you think. I want to tell you, I know this for a fact. Not because I'm a genius or because I'm a prophet or not. I just like you. Oh, I'm saying this because I read what God says about you. And this doesn't lie. Now, so, you know what? Yeah, Miriam was used by God. She could be stoked about that, right? He played a big role, like I said, in saving Moses' life and that Moses would now become the, the savior of that time that would point to Jesus Christ. But he would be the one that leads Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. Uh, God used her, like I said earlier, to lead worship a few times. And this leading of worship was really crazy. She took a bunch of women and they, they, they went and they did some crazy things worshiping. There is something you guys need to know about worship. Worship is a crazy, crazy tool. And not only empowering the people of God, but tearing down the gates of hell. It is unbelievable. And this lady had the privilege to do this. Again, she was called a prophetess. I mean, she, she carried that title of prophet, a woman prophet. And I don't know about you, but just those three things to me, I think, man, the lady's pretty awesome. What went wrong? Well, I think this is something, or where we all can go wrong, is that she allowed her gifts, position, and how God was using her in the past to lead her to this, to assume, I should say, that she had a higher position than, or a position of authority in Israel. Okay, it's kind of crazy. I want you guys to understand this. We are all children of God. In fact, the scripture says, holy priest of the most high God. That's a very high title. 
In fact, not only are we the holy priests, God has given each of us the authority to move in kingdom activity. Okay? But any time we think we are above the authority of God, that we are the bomb, then we lose focus and we find, we're going to find ourselves in a very dangerous place. All worship, all glory, all acknowledgement goes to the Lord. We all can be used for great things and that is awesome, man. You know, like we mentioned last week, the body is made of so much different people and people with different gifts. But each of the gifts must operate together in order that the body will be healthy and functional. Right? What good is the body again as we talked about last week? It's just one big eye. All you can see, you can look, but you can do nothing. Right? Worthless. But when we're working together, we have one understanding, having visions, one prophesying, one moving in healing, one moving in praying. What I mean, it's just everybody operating and then the body now starts to operate in such a place, which we were talking about earlier. The body is unified. When the body is unified, then God can pour out His Spirit in such a way, crazy things happen. The kind of stuff that we're reading in the New Testament. The kind of stuff we read about in the Old Testament. You see, God doesn't have a problem moving in His authority in our times. The problem is we have a problem submitting and trusting God and working together as one church, one body, and not individually. You see, this spirit that Mir Miram have can be called a Jezebel spirit. And just because it's Jezebel doesn't mean it's only ladies. Guys can get the same way. Right? So what we need to do is we need to understand what God is saying. That yes, you have special gifts and you are the bomb. You need to operate in that gift because it's important. And this body here needs to operate in its gifts. But your gift doesn't lift you up any higher than the people on this side. This side doesn't lift up anybody else's, you know, or, or better than these guys. Are, but together we lift up the one that should get the recognition. His name is Jesus Christ. As we recognize Jesus, we bring glory to the Father. And the Father in heaven is just blown away with his people. He says, you know what, Holy Spirit? Give him a dose. Pour all of me out upon that church. I'm not telling you guys right now. You guys have no idea. I want to scooby do you right now. I'm telling you. This is huge stuff. Miriam has a crazy lesson for us, right? And so we have to be careful because envy and jealousy will cause us to elevate ourselves and think we better. And we're not. We're not better than nobody. When Jesus comes, we all going to be at the feet of Jesus, even me. The guy that the pastor, I, I'll be right next to you at the toe of Jesus. And we each will give an account of our life. But right now, there's a duty that each of us have to fulfill. That's God's plan. Does that make sense? Well, something else that jealousy and envy does, and, and why it's so evil, is if we allow it to stay in our heart, it starts to feed uh, selfishness. We get selfish. Right? Now, if we take the definition of selfishness, it's self-worship. Okay, it's not just about being greedy. Right? That's kind of, we think, oh yeah, that means you're greedy. Yeah, it's part of that. It's you greedy for all the attention. You're greedy to be worshipped. Look at me. So what? I see 20 of you guys. Oh no, but look at me. I'm special. Right? And then we, we, we know this. You guys know people like that. Like, I'm so special. Well, there is only one again focus that all worship should be given to and that's to God. Right? And if we allow the selfishness to stay within us, the result of that 
selfishness is rebellion. You guys, are, you guys, you guys probably can get get to this, right? Oh, you know what? I don't like what they're saying to me because I don't like it because, you know, that's not my way and then, and then what happens next? So whatever they're going to do, I ain't doing. I don't want to be part of that because, you know what? That's not my stuff. That's the kind of attitude that happens. But that's the kind of attitude that God is showing us is a stink attitude that doesn't belong in the kingdom of God. Hebrews 13.7, this is not on PowerPoint, okay? Uh, Hebrews 13.17, it says, Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be far. Uh, that would certainly not be for your benefit. If you rebel against an authority, whether it's church, work, uh, the law, right? You're not just making your life, uh, that person's life difficult. But you, you are crushing any chances of God's blessing into yours. You see, I've read the scriptures and I'm like I said, I'm not a scholar. You know, um, but I've learned this through scripture. God wants to bless me. And he doesn't want to just bless me a little bit. He wants to bless me in abundance. But in order for me to receive the blessing in abundance, I need to be obedient. Obedient to what? Obedient to his rules. Right? You see, Miriam had to learn the hard way what it's like to rebel against the Lord. She was struck with leprosy instantly. And to have leprosy would be a lifetime disconnection already. You were disowned and you were sent away. And I love the fact that when Moses pleaded with the Lord, we see the heart of God to redeem us. This is, this is the heart that we find in John 3, 16 and 17. If we would repent and cry out and make corrections, God would bring healing into our lives. But I love the fact of this story that when the Lord shows his story, he does it in a way to let us know that there is repercussions for our actions. So, seven days she was sent away. She wasn't allowed to be around the people. In fact, it would be like they took the food there, left it down there, and you know, she would have, when they leave, she could come grab them. She was isolated. And that's what sin does to us, gang. Sin isolates us from the body, from God. Right? It, it, it was, it is so important. Fellowship is so important again. You know, I was thinking about scripture uh, this week because, you know, Candy, the, the, you know, and what's going on with Nick and, you know, uh, different situations throughout the year. And uh, I was reminded of a song that we did uh, a while back uh, for Auntie Kekua. And, you know, I, I can't, you know, me and my brain, right? Uh, but it was a song that said, it was a reminding, a reminder of, I need you, and you need me. I don't care what you have concluded in life because of whatever hardship you may have had. Because I've been there at one time in my life where I said, I don't need nobody, all I need is me. Because only me love me, and only me can take care of me then it's a lonely place to be. Yeah, you know, yeah, you can survive. But you, you become cold. 
you become hard and insensitive and you start to change then I got involved in church which wasn't my idea I never liked church because you know church is just a place where they just try to hook you on and in and bring you and make you do all this God stuff then I realized that I had some real friends over there that I could trust now I had friends in the world they were my drinking friends my drug friends my dealer friends right? all these guys that could lead me and get me all the stuff that would fix me for a moment but they wasn't doing it because they loved me they was doing it because they wanted my money I could take care of them they didn't care if my life was being totally dysfunctional what they cared about was the dollar that I was going to give. Then I came to church. Now it didn't happen overnight. I knew what this church guy is up to. They're sneaky. Right? They're, they're devils. I, I tell you, I was horrible. And then I started listening and I just said, you know what? Hey, that one truth sounds pretty cool. I can relate to that. And then came another truth, and another truth. And before that, I was finding myself in church every weekend. Eventually, I received the Lord, and my life changed. Now, my closest friends, my network of people that keep me alive today, are all believers. When I'm having problems, I run to a believer. When I irritate it, I run to a believer. Even when I want to say stupid stuff, I run to a believer. Now, not any believer, okay? But I run to the ones that have become close friends with me that I'm able to just be real honest about how ugly I feel and what I think and what I want to do. And they listen to me and they shake their head sometimes and they go, hmm. <laughs> and then afterwards they go are you okay and I'm like now I am you see because sometimes we just gotta get that stuff out you have no I can't you know I'm thinking about this Miriam has been in fellowship all these time and now to be isolated from the very source of her strength which was people who reminded her who her strength was you see, you guys know my situation and you guys don't even realize the strength you guys instill in me that allows me to continue to search and seek God's plan for my life in the midst of a crazy world I live in. Does that make sense? Right, so I, I, I'm feeling Miriam. I'm like, man, sister, I feel for you. Yeah? So don't do that again, you know? And I'm thinking to myself, you too, you know? Because if we're not careful, we act like that and we receive the same punishment. How many times have we done that? Where we get so irate and we're jealous and, and angry and, 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 and envious and next thing you know, we start rebelling. And who do we throw out when we rebel? All right? Before I can rebel against anything Steph is doing you know what I gotta do first I need to throw God out because then I don't I'm not gonna feel bad I'm gonna feel good if she heard it yeah but as long as God is in the way the Lord has said do you really think that's what I wanted do you know you're hurting me more than you're hurting her and I'm like oh now you're just making me lose my case here right so usually what always happens is we throw Jesus out to the side first and here's the danger. God will not force himself on us. Anytime we tell him, take his covering away from us, he will. When he remove his covering, we are open to demonic authority moving into our life. You see, it's a big deal. So, I love it when he says, 
He gives the illustration of a father who spits in, in the child's face. And they need to be uh, uh, repercussions for their actions. Now, like I said, the danger is that when we start to rebel, we put ourselves on this own island. And it's kind of like we were talking earlier or in the book we say, we make our own little circle and nobody's allowed in that circle. I lived my life like that a long time. That this is my circle and I can play and I can laugh and I, I, I can let you think you're my best friend, but you're nothing to me. Because the bottom line is survival is all about junior. And God taught me a different way, an unfamiliar way. You know, I've shared this before and you guys, you know, we all make fun of it. Since I met Jesus, I'm a big crybaby. I wasn't like that before. What, what's the difference? It's just this. I see God's heart for me. And in the midst of all the stupid things I've done, I tell you right now, all the dumb things I've done, this should be the last place that God puts me. In fact, I should already have my own little room in hell. But God says, not with me. I don't care what you've done in your life. If you come to me, I will wash you clean. And I was like, awesome. But you know, you might have to use claw rocks and all that stuff to try to get this stuff out. He goes, my power is something you cannot even begin to imagine. And then, this is something the Lord told me, and this is where I, my personal walk with him is. And the thing he says is that, just know this, I'm okay with the little steps. We as Christians, we make the, the mistake that everybody's supposed to change overnight. But God told me, personally, that He loves my little steps. Because of years of being this way, I couldn't just change. Little steps. And as I took little steps, God honored those steps as I honored Him. Things started to change. So, what happens is if we start to rebel, we start to find ourselves in this little place, right? Because what happens, uh, how should I put this? So what envy and jealousy do to us is they don't only put us on this island or separation or isolation, but it gets us into the, you know, the things where uh, it's about us. It's about resentment. It's about what I want. It's about you know, not repenting and they get into a really confusing place where we are totally lost and we cannot find our way back. Now, just in case you guys don't know this, I think some of you guys know, this is not my first rodeo. I was saved sometime before and I never ever got a hold of it and I had some bad experiences in the church. I went out and I became a food on drug addict, alcoholic, homeless and everything. I was like, the church is full of it. And then there was something in me just told me there was something more I was missing and I knew it was God. I just didn't know how to grab it. And I say grab it is grab on to what he was sharing. I took a chance and we went to a church that I thought was a cult. Why? Because it was in a cafeteria. Church is not happening in a cafeteria, right? Well, we ended up going, long story short, I'm here today. You know, and this has been some 20 some years now. And I've been really blessed to have some people in this room journey with, my, with me for that, that long. Uh, when we start isolating ourselves and anything, we end up covering, we end up getting covered with the evidence of our sin. It becomes so noticeable, all right? And that alone in itself starts to change us because now we have to be on alert. We go into a defense mode and get ready for people to point out what we know is wrong. 
Now, more than just being filled with the evidence of your sin, what's worse than that? You know, well, I can think of something that's worse than that. What's worse than that for me is to not receive the fullness of God's blessing into my life. If God say he have a blessing for me that is beyond my understanding and beyond my capability of holding, it is too big, too huge. I don't want anything less. Sorry. If I gave, you know, I told Brad, oh, right, I'm going to give you $1,000. He goes, ah, $10 now. <laughs> He ain't gonna say that. If he need, I'm gonna pray for him, you know what I mean? Because that would be like, give me the thousand dollars. Well, if God has the kingdom of heaven for us, I don't care what your life is like. God is working something in you. Remember we talked about this last week. As crazy as it may seem, you are at an outpost where God needs you. Your life will be a testimony of the power of God. And as we submit to this time and trusting Him, all of it will make sense. He goes, wow, that sounds really good and easy. No, I'm going to be honest with you. My life right now sucks. But you know what? I'm trusting that in this time when my life is crazy, God is doing a work that I don't understand. And I'm not ashamed to tell him, I go, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing. You're driving me crazy. I talk to God just like this, okay? And, 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 and you know, the sooner you show me, the, the more easy it's going to get for me. And guess what? I don't hear nothing. I'm like, okay, I guess that means I just keep going. Because the last time I read in scripture, is that I keep praying and I keep asking till he gives me an answer. If he hasn't given me an answer, that means the answer is keep moving. It doesn't mean throw your hands up and quit. It means keep moving. You never reached it yet. Do I like it? No, like I said, it sucks. Now, if you ask me in general about my life, I'll tell you I have a great life. My situation sucks. Yeah. So, we look at this. How do we fix that? How do we ensure that we're not getting caught up in this place? Well, we need to cultivate. We're only going to be one point. That's so cool. See, God makes it so easy, right? One point. We need to cultivate. We need to grow humility. We read this. Moses is a great example. And so when I was doing the study, we, we read in the, in the scripture, right? There's that part in parentheses that said that Moses was a humble man, the most on all the earth. So I started to research that and, and tried to get uh, how that went there. Because, you know, you guys realize Moses wrote the first five books, right? So something kind of went on here. Well, it is said... Um, this is just what the commentaries and people scholars say it was put in later but it was put in it's really crazy because I believe it's a point that was put there to help us to understand what it takes Moses becomes an example but we have a greater example of humility right someone who has this humble spirit and and his name is Jesus all right he's our Savior Philippians 2, 5 to 8 says this, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of his equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and denied a, a, a died a criminal's death on, on a cross. I love this. Right? Because there's something here you gotta hear and that you gotta catch. When Jesus gave up, uh, how does it say? Uh, uh, when Jesus gave up his privilege or he gave up everything, 
I want you guys to understand it doesn't mean Jesus gave up who he was. He was still God. And I started to think about this and I want you guys to understand this. How many of you guys realize that you was created the way God wanted you to be? I don't know your name, brother, but God created you that way, okay? Huh? Melvin. Melvin. God created you. You are unique and special. Same thing with Stephen. Unique and special. Same thing with Steph. Unique and special. God designed each of us with purpose. When he's asking us, now, 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 now this is the part where we struggle, okay? This is where Junior will struggle. Oh, when you come to the Lord, you need to die to self. What? Yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna die. I mean, I am who I am. I am a, I, I'm a troublemaker. You know, if you fall on in front of me, I'm not gonna say, oh, Putin, I'm not gonna pray for you first. I'm gonna laugh. And after I have a good laugh, I'm like, oh, bro, are you okay? You know what I mean? Then I'm gonna feel sorry if you got hurt, but if you're not, I'm like, yeah, that was so cool, that was funny, yeah. You know, that's the kind of, kind of person I am. I hide in the bathroom and I wait till somebody comes so I can scream and yell at them. You know, this kid, I love it. That's the kind of person I am, right? Uh, so now when I come to Jesus, uh, that means I cannot be who I am? No. God created you the way you are. He's not trying to keep, change that. You keep that. But what he's trying to get us to surrender is all that other stuff that keeps us to, uh, unfocused to who God has truly called us to be. Jesus is a great example of this. I, I, I got this down. I want, and then we'll get ready to close. I'm just going to read some, some of this stuff. <coughs> so it says this. Uh, they're talking about Jesus being humble. Right? He was humble in that he took the form of a man and not more glorious creature like an angel. Think about it. He's the son of God. And out of all the things he decides to be was the form of a man that would become the sacrifice and the atonement for all man's sin. He could have been an angel. He could have been greater than just one common man. Right? Now, not only did he take on that, he, he was so humble in that he was born in, in a oppression, in a place that people look at and it goes, ew. He was born in a, in a manger, in, in, in a, what we would call a pen, right? The farm, you know, area kind of thing. Uh, he was humble in that he was, uh, he wasn't born rich. Think about it. If I got, you know, or if I'm gonna be born, you know, we probably all you guys probably have a dream, yeah. But if I had my way, I would be a millionaire, right? But he was so humble that he knew that the best way to get the message across and that would draw people in wasn't to be a rich person, but to put him put himself into a place where poverty was his deal. It's crazy, right? Um, what else? Let's jump over here. He was crazy. This is a really good one for the kids, you yeah. He was son of God, but he placed himself under the authority and obedience of his parents. Joseph and Mary like, hey, you might be my mother, but I get more power. All right? And he never once said that. He fell under the authority. He humbled himself. Ah, uh, wait, what was that? Love this. He humbled himself in the sense that he could have surrounded himself with smart, intelligent, powerful people. Instead, he get the disciples. A bunch of guys that was uh, fishermen, tax collectors, 
prayer of Dr. Jair. You see, he humbled himself to where it wasn't about him, but it was what would be the best thing for someone else, in this case, us. So when we come to the Lord and the Lord says, will you die to yourself? You know what the Lord is saying to us? Will people be more important to us than ourselves? Will my compassion be more about the problem somebody else is going through than it is about mine? You see, I think when we are humble and we, we, we cultivate this humbleness, jealousy and envy cannot grow. <clears throat> because there's nothing to be jealous about. You see, comparison is really a bad thing, yeah? But comparison is just a doorway to these two guys getting into our lives and messing us up. And so whenever that creeps in, gang, okay, we'll get ready to end. Whenever jealousy or envy creeps in, I want you guys to know that it is not the work of the Lord. It is the work of the enemy, and he's trying to steal your heart of thanksgiving. You know what? Maybe your life does suck. Oh, my life sucks worse than everybody, but I can guarantee you I can find somebody else's life that is worse than yours. I guarantee you that. And we talked about this last week. What if we change that mindset around? What if we start to say, you know what, Lord, I thank you for the life I have. May not be much, but I'm waking up. May not be much, but I'm eating. May not be much, but I get close. You know, I mean, so think about it. I mean, we, we, can, we have so much things we can be grateful about. And if we're grateful about those things, we're not minding somebody else's business and what they have. I don't think it's wrong to want to... Uh, uh, Strive for more. But you know what? What's happening in Auntie's life is for her. And what's happening in Jay's life is for Jay. And what's happening for me in my life is for me. And as much as we are all in different positions and different places, you know, whether it's financial, spiritually, emotional, physically, it is the outpost that God has placed us in. So will we take that responsibility and take care of our watchtower? If we are too busy being envious and jealous, we're not watching for any danger. We're inviting danger by neglecting the duty of watching. Does that make sense? Awesome. Uh, I want to get ready to call up the worship team. And then uh, we're going to pray. And uh, then we're going to worship. Okay? Uh, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And I thank you so much for this story of Miriam. It is crazy. Who would have thought, you know, that this kind of stuff would go happen. Uh, that would happen in, in, in someone or people that are just full of you, Lord. I mean, they're, they're just fully embraced with your presence. This is the high priest and the prophetess. That's kind of getting it all wrong. The awesome thing behind this is that it just reveals to us that even us today, if we're not careful, we can get caught up in this lie that the enemy will put in, in front of us. Whenever jealousy or envy comes into our hearts, Lord God, help us to send it to the pits of hell. Help us to not allow it to manifest in any way that it will start to get our hearts in the wrong place. So again, Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for loving us. While everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed, 
Uh, you know, if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know, all you need to do is look up. I'll pray with you. And all we are saying is that, you know what? I surrender my life to Him. Uh, I, I want to live my best I can for Him. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a day-by-day -day thing. And even for those who are watching on the television, the same thing. You can do the same thing. So if this is you, anybody want to pray and I receive Jesus, you guys can look up. If not, we'll move on and we'll pray. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come for you. Uh, come to you and for you, Lord God. We want all of you. And so, you know, as our hearts are stirred and, and, and we are moved, Lord God, I pray that we realize it is you who is speaking to us. Now, Lord, would you empower us to change? Would you empower us to see the work that you have for us? And may we embrace it with an attitude of, of joy, Lord God, that we know that you love us too much to allow us to be deceived into walking the wrong way. You know, and, and for any of you that receive, you want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I'll, I'll just put it out there. It's really simple. All you need to do is just say, Jesus, I, I love you. I, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me for my sins. Help me to learn more about you. Help me to understand more about you. And from this day forward, I choose to walk with you. And forgive me. Forgive me for the wrong I've done. And we just love you and we thank you. And we bless you in Jesus' name. So if you have received Jesus Christ out there, you know, send in the web. Uh, send a notice or check in uh, hopechapelyni.org go to contacts and you can get us from there okay so until the next time just be blessed we love you guys